And we'll continue our, our last segment with um, a talk from Matt McClary about API management in the age of AI. The first two segments were about LLM, AI, and APIs, but Matt uh, will have a great wrap-up of what has been said. Hello, Matt. How are you? Matty, what's going on? Things are great, like always, and we have you, so it's, it's uh, double, double dipping on, on red. Awesome. Okay, I pressed the right button, I think, so I'm in presentation mode. No, thanks for the opportunity. I always love... API Days events. I especially love Interface being a global event. So thanks very much for having me here. Um, so I will, uh, I'm, I'm going to do a talk. I think it's thematic on, uh, hey, isn't everybody talking about AI? Uh, this is really, you know, having, having been in the API management space for a long time, uh, I wanted to sort of examine where API management is going through this lens of moving into the AI boom or whatever this this new age is that we're, we're moving into. So yeah, I'm a bit clickbaity here, but I think a lot of the, the stuff I'm going to talk about are actually, you know, the culmination of a lot of trends that have already been taking place in the API management space, but they definitely are a fit for, I think, where organizations are going to be going who want to take advantage of AI technologies. So I've been a long time supporter and a fan of API Days events, uh, and I've been in the API space a long time. I am recently now uh, just started as CTO at Boomi. Um, Boomi's had a long uh, history in the integration and API space as well, uh, but but certainly um, we're doing a lot around around API management and AI uh, as we move into a new chapter here. Um, but this talk is not so much about hey. Let me tell you all about Boomi. This is really about my experience having been in the API economy almost from the beginning, but also b before that uh, in the early days of web services. And, and it's always fun. If, if anyone who's, who knows my talks will know I like to uh, do start with the history lessons. But just, just a couple of things to highlight here. It's, it's, it's launching soon. Uh, Mike Amundsen and I have a new podcast that's going to be starting uh, quite soon. We've recorded the first episode. That's the API experience that you see there. And I also wanted to highlight that uh, Stephen Fishman and I are writing a book for IT Revolution, which is very much about APIs called Unbundling the Enterprise. So we'll be exploring everything I'm talking about today. We'll be exploring on those channels as well. So as promised, uh, let's get into a brief history of API management. Um, I think that uh, for those of us who've been in it for a while, we may still be thinking about API management as this hip new thing, but we're talking about uh, a 15 year legacy at this point, right? Or even, even before that, I think Mashery launched in 2006, but um, you know, the early days of the API economy were very much about this idea of mash up, mashed up web applications. Then mobile came along, kind of exploded this whole new category that was called API management. At the time, that was kind of the heyday of service-oriented architecture, SOA. And so it was very much in contrast to that to say, hey, you know, if you're going to be writing these new mashups or mobile apps, you're going to need to use all these cool API technologies that are out there. So here's a, here's a new set of tools that you can use to help your, if you're an API provider, to help your users figure out what your API does, get the documentation, test it, use it. And, you know, included some stuff like rate limits and monetization ideas, very much focused around this sort of external API ecosystem. And the term API economy was used a lot at that time. But very quickly, and, and, you know, it's hard for me as a veteran of the SOA space not to see the parallels between what happened in the API economy and what happened to the early days of web services. It sort of was hijacked into this, what I will call the SOA governance 2.0 uh, realm where a lot of organizations were saying, you know, actually what we want to do is we want to use APIs for internal integration and we want to help our, you know, integrate all the applications that we have. We're going to use APIs to do that. So we need this whole different type of API management, which is very much focused around that. That's where we got into more of this idea of layered architectures, of different classifications for APIs, um, not only thinking about APIs as they exist and publishing those, which was the early days of the API economy, but more like how do we create APIs out of the stuff that we have? And then getting into life cycle, policy, definition, enforcement, all that stuff. Then, then the microservices boom hit around 20, 
I think it was 2014 with the Fowler Lewis post. Um, 2016, it was absolutely screaming. And that's when API management kind of got into, okay, how do we, how can we be more aligned with DevOps and the full life cycle and automation of the SDLC? How do we get into the microservices world containers, you know, service mesh was a concept that came up around then. And then there was all these new specifications and protocols that started being popularized, GraphQL, gRPC, uh, and a lot more event driven stuff with uh, being especially a resurgence of event driven architectures around microservices, big focus around developer experience as well, catering to developers and the previous presentation, we we're talking about a lot of those good practices. So we've gone through these three phases of API management. So what, what is it that comes next, right? This is what I want to explore today. I'm calling it AI native API management. Um, it's really API management attuned for the world as it is today. And I want to explore these different categories. I'm going to go in them in, in more detail. But, but first, you know, there was a very um, timely blog post that came out recently from Greylock, uh, big VC, talking about the new new moats. In fact, I think this was actually an update to a blog post that came out six years ago, talking about using uh, this idea of AI as a new moat, big Silicon Valley term. How do you protect your business? How do you have a long running sustainable business model? And how do you build a moat around your business so that you can grow without being disrupted? And in that, I thought there was, you know, the visuals are, I think, pretty powerful for the space that we're in, um, in, in the, the world of APIs. Because for a long time, we've been talking about this idea of systems of engagement, you know, customer facing applications that have end users and systems of record, which are the core sources of, uh, you know, non-repudiated sources of information, um, backend systems. And a lot of the work that we've done in the uh, API world has been integrating the systems of engagement with the systems of record. So this blog post introduces this idea that, you know what, in the new world, we're going to have those systems of record. We're going to have the systems of engagement, but we're going to have this other layer of systems of intelligence, which is really what I see as something that's been happening for a while, this convergence of the world of analytics, which had been historically an offline thing, more of a function for people to crunch the numbers and then go through a long protracted SDLC to get anything into those systems of engagement and systems of record. But now with the advances in big data technology, analytics, AI, um, you know, deep learning models, we're, we're really closing the loop there so that the systems that weren't able to be real time are now real time. And that's the systems of intelligence. So they can actually plug right in in real time with the systems of engagement and the systems of record. That has huge implications in terms of how systems are going to be integrated. And so you know, in the past, as I mentioned, we might be integrating between the systems of engagement and the systems of record. These are the classic API use cases, even whether it's external or internal, sometimes you'd be integrating between. But now we've got this huge explosion of APIs I think we're gonna see that are gonna be required to connect all these three layers, right? It's actually, if you do the exponential math, it's gonna be more than doubling the amount of interactions that are gonna be happening in those environments. If you look at how uh, AI models are typically being plugged into systems of engagement today. It is via API. So this is going to have a huge impact. We're just going to be a lot more APIs. And the dynamics of how they're going to be used, I think, will, will also change. I'll talk about that in more detail. So the first area, though, I just want to explore around this future of APIs is something that, as I said before, is a culmination of things that were already happening. So if you go out to a lot of big organizations today, or even you know web startups, mobile startups, they have this issue where things are moving so fast in their environments. They're, they've got legacy systems, and you know, maybe they have on-premise legacy systems. They're in the middle of cloud migration. They're using third-party SaaS apps. Um, they might be using third-party API-based services. There's so many APIs integrated all over the place, it's hard for them to get a grasp on how many APIs they have. So 
uh, there's this problem, and you've probably heard it referred to by lots of different uh, marketing brochures <laughs> called API sprawl. Like it's just all the APIs. I have so many APIs that I'm using and publishing in my environment. I don't even know where they all are. And I think that we've done a good job in the API management space for a long time of giving tools that will allow organizations to add those capable, you know, find the APIs, add them. But just the scale of API usage, you can't do that manually anymore. And so this idea of dynamic discovery, I think, is really profoundly important that to be uh, to, to really follow, be able to provide the full set of governance around the API assets that you have, you need to be dynamic. And by dynamic, that means that, yes, you need to sort of be, have automated ways of discovering APIs. And we've seen some really cool uh, technologies that do this, uh, either by scanning code repos looking for APIs or via network sniffing to find APIs, like there's stuff out there. So that type of capability is fundamental because it can be used in lots of different contexts because some of the companies uh, you know, that, that would come to mind there, Akita around diffing and optic doing similar stuff, traceable AI doing, doing dynamic discovery, that capability of being able to dynamically discover uh, APIs is going to be crucial and it has to be continuous. It can't just be a one-time thing, being able to almost like a, an organic approach of plugging into the ecosystem sensing when things change, finding new APIs, that's vital for companies that are going to be wanting to govern the full set of APIs that they have. So I think that's something, and certainly AI can play a role here, right? Because, because there's gonna be so much, um, so much to cover, so much ground to cover, so much complexity out there. Uh, again, you need to automate the discovery, find the anomalies, be able to assimilate a lot of information in order to make sense of it. So AI is going to be vital in solving that problem in a useful way. Um, the second one, I think, that ties into that, like if you've got all those assets and now you can find them all, is uh, what I'm calling digital asset governance. So I think for a long time we think of API management. Let's be honest, a lot of the tooling has been very much focused on RESTful APIs. Right? And that's been great because they're ubiquitous and they're used in all these different contexts. But as companies move to more maybe container native systems that are using gRPC or they, they bought into the GraphQL <laughs> hype and they're using GraphQL or, um, or being more event driven, all of those interactions and, and even data products, like I think that uh, data mesh is going to have a big impact here. Like we, we need to think about Essentially, why are we managing APIs in the first place? Because the APIs are an abstraction of, of all the business capabilities that an organization has or uses. While business capabilities can be packaged via RESTful APIs or these other mechanisms, event streams, um, data products, and so on. So we have to be able to uh, plug into all that, and, and, and we need governance across all of those things. And by governance, I'm not, you know, it's not putting up a wall. Governance is really about aligning the operating environment with the organizational strategy, right? And so it's it's really important. I think governance embodies some of that discovery and really being able to have a, a, a true sense of what's, what's going on in the organization in order to make the right decisions in order to drive the business forward. So I think that this idea of abstracting this digital asset governance out of API management or extending it out of API management is going to be fundamental as well. And I think, you know, there's, there's some great ways when it comes to trying to divine meaning from a lot of complex metadata, machine metadata, that's another place where AI can play a role here in sifting through all of that and coming to a level of understanding. The final area to probe on is, is an area, again, that's been around for a while, but I think for a lot of reasons has been somewhat in the background. And that's API management from the consumer perspective. Right. There's for a long time, I would even argue for for as long as there's been an API economy, APIs, most organizations have entered the API economy, like external APIs as consumers first, even though a lot of the focus around API management is on how do we 
you know, give tools to organizations to turn their assets into APIs that can be launched into the economy and monetized, et cetera, et cetera. For most organizations, the first time they enter the API economy is when there's a third party service out there that they want to consume and they get the API key and they plug it in and away they go, right? Well, that is going to be even way more pronounced when it comes to AI because as these foundational models come out that people are going to use, they're going to be delivered via API and only so many companies are going to really be able to deliver foundational models. If you understand the computational power required and the data corpus and all that, right? That's a huge investment. So it's not like every company is going to be whipping up these large language models. So I think that there's going to be a massive ratio of consumers tipped in favor of consumers versus providers. And that's going to drive a lot of consumption. The other thing is that as you consume these AI models, we're already seeing a much bigger focus on ethics, data privacy, you know, just that whole realm of fair use around AI services that we might not see in like consumer services like payments or geolocation service and so on. If you're utilizing these AI services, there's already, thank you, maybe maybe thanks to, uh, you know, years of sci science fiction that's out there, there's already a healthy uh, risk aversion in the, in the community around that. So the idea of, you know what, we want to safely go into this new space and consume these models, that is going to be put, put more of an onus on companies to think about how they manage the consumption of their APIs, right? That, that I think that, uh, and there's a big opportunity here as well for AI infused capabilities to help sort those problems out. Like for example, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of deliberate uh, obfuscation of information in terms and conditions in, in API products and so on. Really being able to leverage uh, learning models to sift out and find the important information, I think, is a good use there. But there's going to be risk management needs. There's going to be the need to control access, throttle access to third-party APIs. I think you'll see a real need around managing the consumption of APIs. So, uh, oh, sorry. And I do have one more area here. Um, I, I forgot there was a fourth. I'm, I'm so stuck on my rule of three. <laughs> I think another thing that we're, that we're finding, which is related to the consumption of APIs, is that we're, as much as there's a need to cater for developer experience, as much as we know developers are the primary users today of APIs, and if you are an API provider, you want to streamline the developer experience, give the right tools, think in that mindset. I think that historically in the API economy, too much has been put on the developers because, you know, on one hand, we talk about APIs as products, which is a good thing, right? We think we need to think about APIs as products. We need to think about how we package them appropriately, how we have good business models behind them, all that. But then we turn around and assume that our only interaction in the, in the consumer spaces with developers, which is wrong. Like, should the developers be the one reading the terms and conditions? Should the developers be the one really thinking through the price implications of what they're going to be signing up for? There's a whole other set of consumer personas that we need to cater for in the API space. And that goes, I think it also applies to the usage of API management today. I would say API management tooling is very much biased towards central centralized groups, technical users, IT ownership, right? As we get more and more diverse uh, in terms of the, the scope of, of API usage, when we're dealing with that sprawl, there's a lot more people that need to be involved. And so AI gives us the opportunity as well to really automate and streamline the user experience for all these different personas that we're going to be dealing with. So, um, so I've given you four areas where I think that the landscape of API management is going to change with in this new age of API APIs, just to give a little, uh, you know, to wrap it all in a bow here, imagine uh, a bank, fake bank, anyone who uh, attended any of my O'Reilly sessions, I, I created this fake bank called Islay Bank, which is uh, based in Scotland. Um, <laughs> imagine 
that uh, today they've got a lot of areas where they're adjudicating products um, and they're doing credit checks on customers. Well, imagine that they said, you know what, we're, we're not sure exactly all the places where we are using credit bureau services. So what if we could run dynamic discovery and go out there and find out all those places? And let's say they do that and they use dynamic discovery and they go out and they find they've got, you know, 15 different credit bureaus being called, different plans, different IDs, and they're just spending a whole lot of money calling these third-party APIs. Well, they've already identified an opportunity through dynamic discovery to, to, to solve a problem that they didn't know that they had. But then let's say they thought, you know, maybe there's a way where we could, we could actually solve this problem once instead of um, relying on third parties exclusively for doing these credit checks on customers. So they might actually either use an existing data lake on customer information, or they might want to stand up something specific to do this uh, service. And they could create event streams, right? Which historically, maybe they couldn't manage through API management, but now they've got the ability to, um, to treat event streams as first-class data assets. They create this event stream to feed a data lake and create a set of data products around credit services that they can then um, use to improve their credit scoring and start to throttle back their usage of the credit bureaus. They could take this a step further and become API consumers. Maybe there's a third party um, you know, machine learning model they could use to feed some of that information, which would come back with better scoring. They could use data that they already had themselves without going out to the credit bureau to feed into that and get much more prescriptive results, much more flexible results at the same time that they throttle back their usage of credit scoring from third parties. So they're using this consumer management. They're, they're able to connect into a third party and do the right risk management around that. And they're able to use some consumer management rate limiting to throttle usage of the third parties. And then finally, maybe that now that they've got all that information in one place, they can start to not only bake that into their real-time systems to do better credit sc scoring, but using the metadata that they've got in the API management system, now they can start to aggregate that information and find some trends and scoring insights that are in use for not only their technical users, but their business community users. Maybe this is a somewhat uh, you know hurried and, and slightly contrived scenario, but just to give you an idea of how we can go much farther than maybe the, the narrower scope of where API management is today, we can see how it becomes a fundamental enabler for the business in the age of AI. I mean, I, I, I sincerely believe that um, if you're an organization, like, yeah, go play with chat GPT and BARD and, and have fun. And, and there's lots of, lots of exciting use cases to blow your mind on things. But if you're an organization that actually wants to get business value out of, um, out of AI, you have to be an organization that's API ready. You have to be an organization that can easily consume APIs, e easily um, provide APIs, easily integrate them into your user experiences. And I think that API management can evolve to make that uh, a much more obvious thing for organization. So just to summarize again, those four areas that I see evolving in, in, in the age of AI, I think dynamic discovery becomes more fundamentally important and can be AI enabled. Thinking broadly, instead of just API management, thinking generally about digital asset management, I think is where we can extend it because I think that as organizations become more composable, they will want to look at different packaging besides just RESTful APIs. I think that the thinking through how you manage risk and, and manage consumption of APIs becomes extremely important, as well as um, the multi-user uh, experience idea. There's going to be a lot more people, a lot more personas in the API economy that need to be catered to. Awesome. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Again, I, I think I left a minute or two for... Uh, for questions.
<clears throat> one minute, but uh, let's 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 keep let's use it. One, one question, uh, you know, 20 years ago, um, uh, if you were not uh, indexed by Google, you were not existing because you were not in, in results, right? In, in Google search results, would you do you think that with now 100 million users uh, for ChatGPT and probably soon a billion users for all LLM combined, if your if your APIs in your data is not connected to LLMs? It may not exist in, in, in the end user interface. If you are Lufthansa or United Airlines or American Airlines, if your APIs are not connected there, when someone will ask what's the cheapest flight or the to, to go from that place to another, you will not exist in the results. So is it a is it a, a LLM or die? I think I mean I think we'll get there, right? I think that the um, you know Google what Google came out in 98, I think by 99, 2000 started to be used widely. So it was already what, like 10 years in when the, when the, you know, when the API economy hit mobile hit and all that. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, the, pl the plugin framework, I, th I think it's, it's probably a little bit too early to tell how that whole plugin ecosystem is going to play out. Right. And I think that there's going to be some power struggles there as well, because, Uh, right now, everyone's in this stage of let's rush in and get into the chat GPT without maybe thinking through the business implications there. So I would just say if, if you're an organization saying like, should we create a, a plugin? I think it's going to depend on what your line of business is and what you what you may be giving away if you if you if you go to that model. But I do think that um, definitely the way the Internet is accessed will evolve based on this. Like, I think it's that big. I think it's, I think if the, the only, the, the comparables to me are the dawn of the web, right? Where Google maybe is the predominant player in terms of access point for search. Then the dawn of social networks, because I think Facebook was the big disruptor there in terms of if you were to look, what was the, what was the place that sort of took over from Google, at least in some respects, it would be Facebook in terms of how, how information was shared there. And now we have this potential next phase with, with chat GPT. But I, uh, you know, I mean, it's definitely, definitely you should be looking at it and, and seeing it, but, but make sure you're thinking about if it makes sense for your organization to do that. Because as we know, as you know, many, like you've talked, you've done, I've seen you do talks on this, the way the web has evolved. A lot of times it's owning the customer interaction. If you own the customer interaction, you hold the power, right? And there's ways to try and fight against that, but you got to think through your business model. Yeah, the last smile to the customer is where all the value is. Thank you very much, Matt.